Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Town of Portland weekly podcast. Uh, this is episode number seven, and uh, we are here in the studio with Miss uh, Susan Bransfield, our first select woman. Uh, okay, on the on the line uh, we have Mr. Russ Melman, who is the uh, Chatham Health Director, and soon to be calling in we have Senator uh, Norm Needleman. Okay, uh, and he will be calling in very very shortly. So uh, I hope everybody is doing well. How are you doing, Susan? Very well. Good to be here once again, Dave. Thanks for hosting. Well, thank you so much, and uh, Russ again. And thank you for uh, taking time out of your schedule every week to uh, begin uh, the, the the weekly updates. Uh, oh, my I, pleasure. And I, I think last uh, last week's podcast we're just we're just sort uh, south of four hundred listens. So uh, the great. information is getting out there. So which is great. So. Anyway, um, so I, I think, uh, Susan, if you like, we can start off with... Sure. Okay, that, yep. that would be great. Okay. Russ, I think you got the ball. Yeah, it sounds good. Uh-huh. Uh, so uh, as uh, as been my... Uh, okay, hold, hold on, Russ. Is, uh, Norm, are you on the line? I am now, yep. All right. Uh, just joining us, our uh, state senator, Mr. Norm Needleman. So, uh, Norm, Russ is going to be giving his update on the Chatham Health District, and then uh, we can throw it over to you. So, hang tight. and <laughs> Throw it over. I like that thought. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, uh, sorry to interrupt you, Russ. So, uh, no, why, nope. why don't we get, get on to it? Sure. That's fine. So, uh, happy to I'll, – I'll try to make my remarks uh, – uh, brief so that we can get uh, Senator Neilman in sight to hear what he has to say. Uh, so just uh, some uh, situational updates. Uh, in the last week, at least in Chatham Health District, and that includes Portland, we've seen a what I'll call a stabilization uh, and even a decline in the number of new cases we're seeing. We're, we're still seeing new cases. Uh, in Portland, we've got uh, 52 cases, and unfortunately we have had uh, 12 uh, fatalities um, in Portland. Um, but but that is actually a reduction in the number of new cases that we're seeing on a, on a regular basis. We're, we're averaging now over the last week uh, between two and three new cases a day, whereas the previous couple of weeks we were upwards of five or six new cases a day. So um, the way I look at this, and, you know, we chart all this data, and it, when the – and I'm going to go out on a limb here and say I think at least in part this stabilization and reduction in new cases is – due to mask wearing. And on May 20th, uh, it was required for anybody who is in a place of employment or in a public place where they can't be guaranteed to stay six feet away from everybody else to wear a cloth face covering of some kind or a mask. And the incubation period for this virus, it averages around five days. And lo and behold, starting on around um, April 25th, we entered a week where we've seen the fewest number of new cases per day since last week of March, first week of April. So it's, it's early. You know, there, there are lags in reporting, and, and there are other uh, things that could we could see a correction. This could be a one-week aberration, and we could see another increase. But I'm very hopeful that the messaging around social distancing and the messaging around mask wearing is having a noticeable effect locally. Um, I can't speak for what's going on elsewhere in the state. Uh, I have a hard enough time keeping just what's in front of me in front of me. Um, so, uh, but, but I am very hopeful. So I think people, when I go out and about, I do see a lot of people wearing masks, and that's good, and I'll say it again. I think I said it last week. We all have to get very comfortable with wearing masks. It's going to be with us, I think, for a very long time. Uh, we're going to start thinking about masks, perhaps like we think about a pair of underwear. You're going to find your... The pair, that the, the, the masks that fit well, that you like, um, that are comfortable, you can wear for a few hours a day, and you're going to take them off at the end of the day, throw them in a the pile of laundry and wash them, and then grab the next cloth face mask for next day. Um, I think these are going to become just those things that everybody's wearing all the time. So think of it like in that way, like a, a T-shirt or a pair of underwear or a pair of socks, and um, and uh, get used to it. So, uh, But I'm, I'm hopeful looking at the numbers that we're entering a period where uh, we will see fewer cases and fewer hospitalizations because people are following all these new rules and guidelines and, frankly, social norms. So um, I think I said it last week, and I'll say it again this week, that the people that are at higher risk are, are older adults and people with some underlying health conditions like diabetes and, 
anything that suppresses your immune system, uh, heart disease, uh, certainly any chronic lung conditions that somebody has will make them, that will put them in a higher risk category. Uh, and a lot of people think, well, you know, I do hear a lot of things about older adults being the people who are getting the sickest and making up the, the bulk of the people who are dying from COVID-19. And so what's the big deal with kids going to school? And what's the big deal with, you know, people going to work? Well, when we do these kind of, when we do our contact tracing, and we call people um, and find out, you know, what, what they might have done that might have exposed them to this disease. Um, it's the people who are either working in places where there's lots of people around them or people who are staying at home but are living with somebody who's working. And so when you think about, uh, if you think, well, you know, I, so I've got a multi-generational household, I've got kids, parents, grandparents all living together. If kids are going to school and if parents are going to work and they're coming back, and they may be exposing their older family members. And we are seeing a lot of that. So um, I think we all just have to understand that, that this virus doesn't occur in a vacuum. It doesn't only occur in me because I go to work. It may occur in others because I bring it home. Um, and I bring it home to others that are in that high-risk category. So uh, I think we all need to be cautious in our approach to, to moving forward with Reopening, I think it's important to look towards reopening and, and have good plans, but but do it cautiously. Um, and uh, the one other thing I'll mention this week is camps. We're moving towards summer. I'm sure there are a lot of parents who are thinking, uh, I've been cooped up in my house with my kids for longer than I'm used to. Uh, I've got two kids myself, and I'm working from home. And, boy, there's some days I wish I could just send them out to camp for, for a full day. And um, right. But uh, a camp... Camps will be uh, perhaps opening, but not anytime soon. I think the date that OEC and the governor have indicated is June 29th for camps to open. Uh, and I think that the, the, there are some guidelines put out there in an OEC, that's Office of Early Childhood, my listeners in, uh, uh, in a memo, indicating all of the safety precautions that camps are going to have to take. So for those of you thinking, I want to send my kids to camp, you're going to have to get used to um, answering some questions from the camp staff every day about any symptoms that your child has had or that you might have had in the household. And the camp staff taking temperatures of the kids as they walk in. Uh, it's going to have to be very orderly. Kids are going to be in very small groups, groups of no more than 10. And there's going to be very little mixing. So I'm sure everybody who's dropped off a kid at camp, uh, especially things like park and rec camps, they go to an open space, say, and there's a pavilion and it's mayhem. There's kids running everywhere, hugging each other. Uh, we're going to want to eliminate that kind of situation. So I think camp is, uh, camps are going to look very different this year, as is everything, compared to what we are used to. Um, but we will be working with our, our camp directors uh, to make sure that they, when they do, if they do decide to open, that they do so in the safest way possible. So, uh, but again, we'll be looking at the data. I think the governor's uh, said over and over he will be looking at the data on cases and hospitalizations and making the best but cautious choice as he moves forward with his plans to open this up. Great. Thanks, Russ. Um, that's, uh, that's it. I'll, I'll, I'll stop rambling on and uh, I'll pass it back to you guys. No, that's fine. Um, you know, concerning, uh, I guess, the, you know, uh, per the governor's uh, executive order, uh, we're kind of opening up on the 20th. Um, are there going to be documents that uh, are going to be coming out of your organization or advising, uh, you know, businesses on uh, yes. you know, procedures and so yes. forth? Absolutely. So there's already a lot out there on offices, how offices can open safely, because there are a lot of essential workers who have already been working in offices. So the CDC has a lot of guidelines out there, as does the state. I think where Chatham Health District will be uh, key is with especially the facilities that we regulate. So cosmetology, establishments, salons, those are probably going to be opening up on the 20th if things keep going in the right direction. So I'm sure everybody's desperate to get a haircut, hair color, whatever. Um, we will be issuing guidance for those establishments on how to operate safely um, and as well as restaurants. So restaurants to date have been allowed to operate with drive through and takeout. Right. And the governor has indicated that he may permit restaurants to operate with outdoor dining. And 
when you think about outdoor dining, it sounds great. Everybody pictures their favorite outdoor seating area and whatever restaurant they like to go to. But I will anticipate that a the the seating will have to be a little bit different. We have to make sure that everybody is very uh, spaced apart very well. So we may not see the volume of tables that we're used to seeing at our favorite outdoor establishment. And there may be other restaurants that want to explore doing outdoor dining that haven't done it before. And we will work with those establishments to make sure that what they're doing is done safely. Um, we will be certainly working with our municipalities uh, for places that haven't yet done outdoor dining. There are going to be other things they're going to have to go through with planning and zoning and building officials to make sure that, that, uh, that what they're doing is safe and can be done where they want to do it. And that will be, uh, you know, in addition to the public health side of things that we will work with them on. So we will be issuing guidance, and we've got a team together, people who are skilled in epidemiology, infection prevention, regulation. Uh, so we've got an internal team that will be taking requests for guidance and, and working with our establishments as they move through this process. Absolutely. Great. Thanks for that update, Russ. I appreciate that. And uh, sure. as far as the uh, statistics in, in, in the district, um, you know, we have uh, how many fatalities do we have now in the district? Uh, total in Chatham Health District, we've got 22. And uh, the, just the vast majority of those individuals are our older adults, many of whom uh, the fatalities have occurred in a couple of long-term care facilities that have been experiencing outbreaks. And you know, that is where we have, unfortunately, many vulnerable people with pre-existing conditions, older adults that are living in pro close proximity together. And that is a recipe for a respiratory virus, a respiratory disease, to spread fairly readily, mm -hmm. uh, even given precautions that, that our nurses and our doctors in those facilities are taking, um, we are still seeing some outbreaks, and, and that's where we are seeing the majority of the fatalities occurring. Not all, not exclusively, but of the 22, I believe more than half have occurred in our long-term care facilities, just locally. Right, right. So um, it's, uh, it is unfortunate any time you have a loss of life, and, and really we need to think about those individuals, the, the loved ones that we have um, that are in those facilities or that live with us or who have to go to work or whatever and think we need to protect them. So sure. as we move um, forward with this, we'll be keeping an eye on those statistics to see if we see an uptick and to do everything we can to tamp that down. Sure, and uh, hence the... Uh the requirement for the uh, the face masks and so forth. Yes, I, I'm, I'm glad you said that uh, when you uh, kind of uh, compared them to underwear. I'm glad you said that you well, wash, you wash I, them. <laughs> we we really I think do have to start thinking about it like a regular <laughs> pair of clothing that we put on every day. Sure, underwear, socks, a t-shirt. I mean that's there you go. Got to be laundered. We've got to have enough of them. Eventually, if we do this for months and months, they'll start to wear out. We'll have to get new ones. So there you go. I, I think. People have to start thinking about these things that we're going to be living with them for a really long time. Exactly. You know, and the, and the barber's opening up. I know my eyebrows are getting long. My God. it's like Oh, boy. <laughs> well, I, I hate to tell you this, Dave, but um, um, I think uh, probably the safest thing for barbers to do is to work on the head only. I don't, I don't fancy the idea of somebody manipulating hair near my eyes, nose, or mouth. <laughs> Correct. Um, now, the governor... Governor may permit anything to happen, but I would discourage anybody from doing a lip waxing, for example, um, because <laughs> as safe as you want to be, you don't want somebody's hand near your mouth, frankly, when you're dealing with a respiratory virus. So um, your eyebrows may have to wait a little while longer, Dave. That's all I'm saying. All right. Point well taken. All right. Thanks, Russ. I appreciate all your help and, uh, again, all your uh, great information. So uh, anyway, Susan, back over to you, and I think I'm going to let you introduce our, our next guest, okay, who is uh, patiently waiting on the line. So uh, take it away, Susan. Sure. Thanks, Dave. And thanks again, Russ. Always a good report in terms of information, and I'm happy to hear that the numbers have stabilized. That's something we've all been hoping for, and the, let's hope those days continue. Uh, right here in the studio with Dave and Kevin Armstrong, I am wearing our, my mask, as are the other gentlemen. So it's important, as you said, to make it part of your daily routine and get used to the comfort of it and hopefully protect that person that you are getting in contact with. And I take that very seriously. And I know that other people are, too. Today, we're very delighted to have with us our state senator, Norm Needleman. 
Norm is a esteemed member of the delegation that goes to Hartford. And he's also a, one of our colleagues in terms of being a first selectman. He's been first selectman of Essex for several years. And before that, he served on various boards, including the Board of Selectmen in the town of Essex. So he's going to bring to us today, I know you will, Norm, not just the perspective of what goes on in Hartford, but how that translates to the work that we do in our local towns and how important that work is. So I warmly welcome you, Norm. We look forward to hearing from you. And thank you for attending today. It's good to hear from you. I'll turn it over to Norm Needleman. <clears throat> Thank you, Susan. I just have this vision of Dave's eyebrows sort of extending over his face. And uh, I know when you get older, um, the hair grows in all the places you don't want it to grow. And it doesn't grow in the places that you want it to grow. But I would suggest going online and buying a trimmer and doing it yourself. But I've, I've done that. And point yeah, well taken, Norm. My eyebrows get that ridiculously long at this point. So. Good advice from our state senator, isn't that, Dave? That's good advice. Um, so anyway, I um, I just want to, first of all, thank uh, Susan for giving me the opportunity to speak. Um, and, uh, and I know what a great job she does uh, running uh, Portland on a day-to-day -day basis in good times. And I'm it's just an outstanding leader. Um, you know, I've said this a hundred times, a mentor of mine is a first selectman. Uh, and uh, and I also want to shout out uh, all the local health directors. Uh, this is the most challenging time in every health director's career ever. Um, and trying to stay ahead of it, you know, the, the local health directors, um, I have my own in Essex um, and she's on all the conference calls and at times, the uh, support from Hartford has been better than at others. Um, so a lot of the local health directors are listening and trying to translate uh, to how things should operate in the in the towns and districts that they um, serve. So I, I uh, this has made uh, infinitely more complicated in any of the towns that have uh, nursing homes and group homes where. They're very vulnerable populations, and uh, you know, amongst the tragedies here, the statistics that Russ talked about, with uh, probably more than 50% of the uh, fatalities have been uh, with patients in those uh, long-term care facilities, and there's a double-edged tragedy there because it's not only the patients that are there that are suffering. Um, the highest fatality rates across the country um, and probably across the world, but uh, but the people who tend to work in them are not all doctors and nurses, as we know. Many of them are lower skilled, um, lower paid workers, and uh, and they tend to be a very vulnerable group themselves. So, um, what's causing the problem? It's explainable but it doesn't make it any less of a tragedy, but the lack of personal protective equipment, even at the hospital level, let alone at the nursing home level, is causing these, um, these cases to transmit internally, and many of the nursing homes of the state have uh, virtually 100% of the patients and staff are now infected, and, uh, and it's an absolute tragedy for two vulnerable communities. Uh, so... Uh, so I, I, I'm hoping we can get this under control, but until there's an adequate amount of testing and an adequate amount of personal protection, protective equipment for all health care uh, workers and all group home workers, um, we, we have uh, sort of a hotbed, uh, and uh, I think the state, 50% of the fatalities have been within the nursing home communities, and that's led to some uh, regulations that a lot of people are struggling with, like um, people who have special needs kids that are in small group homes are also now forbidden to see their kids until September. Uh, many of them are obviously adult children, but they're still their children and uh, family members. And a lot of those people are vulnerable emotionally as well as physically. So 
Uh, I'm hoping, as Russ said, that the, the people have gotten it into their heads. I, I see it in ethics where um, people are paying close attention to the rules. You can always get some outliers, and how we deal with that is not going to be simple. Uh, but most people are taking it seriously. The, I'm not sure I would have used the underwear analogy, but it's actually a good one. I may borrow that and use it in the future. Um, but we're going to have to be living with the new normal for quite a long time. And, uh, and uh, until there's a effective treatment, or, uh, widespread testing, um, or uh, more likely until we get a vaccination. So, uh, so this is the new normal, the reopening for all of us that are involved in managing at the municipal level or at the state level, um, the reopening is a concern. We're looking at the data closely to make sure that there's no spike. The two previous weekends where we had really nice weather, I'm sure we all saw a gigantic uptick in the number of people out, and uh, many people are frustrated with having been cooped up. So. Uh, besides the people that are cooperating, you have some other people that are just saying, you know, I want to risk getting this. And the problem, as Russ said, is the, the amount of incubation time is typically four or five days, but it could be as long as 15. And the real killer with this virus is the asymptomatic carriers, people who have absolutely perfect health and no symptoms that are walking around in the public spreading it. Um, that's why the distancing and the masks um, has to stay uh, in place for a really long time. So, uh, so I'm hoping that we've changed behavior enough um, and people are aware enough. Uh, but the data over the next month is going to be very critical to watch because the last thing we need is to have to go back into another full lockdown. Um, I think that Governor Lamont has sort of split a fine hair between keeping stuff open and shutting stuff down. And he's, um, he's, you know, we have a county by county situation and Eastern Connecticut has, thank God, done a little bit better than Western Connecticut and the cities. Um, so I'm not sure blanket policies should be um, necessarily the, the way we go. Um, and why I'm a big advocate, as I know, uh, Susan is for allowing some level of local judgment and local control here. We, we're on the ground. We know our towns. We know how to manage the things going on here. We need big picture guidelines from the state, but um, but we're not New York City. We're not Hartford. We're different and still need to be cautious, still need to be thoughtful, uh, things that uh, may be a little bit easier to manage here. That would be harder to manage there. We need some flexibility uh, because people, kids, adults, we all need some normalcy in our lives. This is such an abnormal situation. Um, just flipping over to the state side of this for a minute, a big outstanding issue, obviously, is people getting the help that they need to bridge uh, until when they go back to work. Hopefully they have a job but a uh, big failure, disaster, um, in my opinion, has been the unemployment compensation software and the flood of people applying. There have not been an adequate number of people to handle all the cases because they do have to be handled individually. And the software was written in a language uh, dating back to the 1970s um, that needed to be modified needed to be modified for the extra $600. It needed to be modified to accept applications from independent contractors. Um, and Department of Labor people are, are doing their best, uh, as frustrating as it is to everybody who's applying. Um, they are really, they have their backs against the wall. They've had well over 300,000 applications, which is typically what you'd get, you know, maybe in the worst recession, but you'd get it over time. Here they got it in a matter of weeks. And uh, and then the extra payment by the feds has to go through them. And the independent contractor uh, applications, uh, which are really critical now, um, are just getting up and running now after what they thought would be a start last Friday. Um, 
I just want to say one thing about that. That's a two-step process, and everybody needs to understand it. You have to apply, get rejected, and then reapply. And um, I don't know why it's set up that way, but it is two-step, and people will get the money, but they will get rejected the first time, and they should not be discouraged by that. Um, I think that's just the way the program has been set up to work. So that money should be helping people, and it will be helping them retroactively. But um, there's a lot of people with a lot of need right now, people who can't afford food, who have to make very tough decisions in their lives. And that's where, as a community, Middlesex County, the, the whole district I represent, um, is a district where people help each other. And, uh, and I know that that spirit is critical to getting through tough times all the time, but this time it's even more important. So if you can help, if you can you know, help somebody who doesn't have the money buy some masks, if you can give away masks, if you can help with food, you know, there's a, dozens of charities that are helping provide basic needs right now, bridging to when, uh, when the state does get everybody who's qualified to receive the unemployment but even after that, I think that um, restaurants and entertainment and, and any tourism-related things, group gatherings, are going to be slow to come back to any level of normalcy. And I think that um, not everybody is going to have a job when all this is over. So it's the time where people who can afford to be and who are lucky enough uh, to continue to work actually end up uh, reaching out and doing everything they can to help their neighbor, help the their senior that's less able to get around, help the people who don't have food, give to food banks, do it, do whatever you can because we're coming out of this slowly um, and, uh, and there's going to be a lot of need out there. And the state obviously is in a massive deficit. The federal government is in a deficit that's unimaginable by any standards and, uh, and, you know, we're gonna we're gonna be helping each other um, survive through this, and uh, and I'm I'm happy to live where I live because that's the spirit that the communities around us have had for you know generations, and we're gonna need to remember that every day of our lives. So, um, sure, I, I, you know, I'm happy to answer any questions if anybody has them, but. Uh, well, I, I think what you, what you're describing, Norm, is is basically what makes up the the fabric of. Portland and Essex, um, uh, there are, you know, uh, good time stories, you know, to be had, uh, and so forth in, inside of all of this, uh, pandemonium, uh, uh, you know, a virus situation. But I think that's what, uh, brings our communities together and, you know, all the good work that, uh, uh, you guys are doing in Harford, as far as that goes between you and Christy, um, I, I think you're representing our, you know, our districts very, very well, uh, going from there. But I, I think, you know, going back to the, uh, the unemployment, uh, we in the IT world, okay, consider that uh, outdated software, what we call legacy software. And, right. and it's, it's, you know, uh, every town has it. Uh, I think your, your town has some. I know we, we still have some uh, legacy softwares. And in order to make it, you know, uh, function in, in, in the, the new uh, technology environment, you have to do patches, and, and that's what they're working on now. Yeah, and and I think it's a wake up call. Um, it, it was, you know, sadly funny in some regard to uh, put out a call for COBOL programmers, and you know, most of them are in retirement communities. Exactly. Now. And uh, you know, most young people in the IT world don't even know what COBOL is. But the whole unemployment system is running not only here, but in Washington on COBOL, which is, was a computer language from the 60s, 70s, and into the early 80s. Um, but the cost to upgrade a system has been a step beyond what the state has been able to afford. But I think in all IT matters, we've come to realize how critical our IT infrastructure is, and we need to keep investing uh, Josh Gabal, who is the COO now for NED, is also the commissioner of DAS. And his big uh, initiative was to, before all this happened and before he now has two jobs, uh, was to upgrade the software infrastructure of the entire state. Uh, and now we're seeing exactly why. 
Um, this is going to be critical. Um, I do want to say one other thing. The state has been promoting that everybody use the How We Feel app. You log in every day. You're basically putting in your zip code and saying how you feel today. It asks you, you know, pretty much the same five questions every day. Um, somebody like me who never feels good, it's like I want to check every box at this point in my life, but none of the things that I feel are COVID-related. So I put down, I feel okay. Uh, but they're using it as, as part of a mechanism for tracking spikes in the virus, and, uh, and it's actually quite helpful. It shows you the number of people that are using it in your community, the number that are feeling okay, and the number that are not. And, um, and you can't look at the absolute numbers, but you're looking at trends in that, and I think that the, we need to push that out there. We've been doing it in our e-blast e e every day or at least once a week, but the towns need to be promoting that also. It's called How We Feel. It's an app on your phone. Uh, the more people that use it, the better the data, and uh, the more we can manage hotspots. And, uh, and I think we're going to be moving into a mode where we're going to be needing to track hotspots um, to make sure we can respond very quickly uh, to outbreaks of the virus, because it's not going away. It no. may subside for a while. We're all worried about the fall. But in the meantime, the more people who sign on to it, the better uh, we can track what's happening in different communities. So. Sure. Well, well said. You know, um, data is power. You know, I mean, the, yep. the more data we have, the more power and natch, uh, you know, knowledge that we have, um, you know, to anticipate and react. Uh, and that's so important uh, in this unprecedented time. So, well, it's critical. And like Russ said, they, they are the, the State Department of Health and the feds have been saying one of the ingredients in going forward is contact tracing. And um, thank God our local districts have been able to do that. When they got to the Western Connecticut health directors, they just couldn't. They were so overwhelmed with cases that they had to throw up their hands. They did the best they could. But these are not, you know, us can tell you Chatham doesn't have 75 people working there. And I think that they're estimating that they could use uh, two or three hundred thousand contact um, tracking uh, people working throughout the country on managing this again to identify hotspots and try to keep track of, of who, if somebody has it, who else they were in contact with to manage those people and sort of quarantine those people down as best as possible. But as you say, Dave, it's it's all about the data at some point, collecting the data and using the data um, to keep people safe. And I think that um, we're going to need to be doing that for the next year, year and a half. So, Sure. Um, and I, I just want to say one other thing, because it is so critical to remember in the midst of a unusual tragedy, this country has gotten through world wars. We got to a pandemic at the beginning of the 20, 20th century. We got to a civil war. We've gotten through a um, financial crisis and Great Depression. What makes us great is our ability to pull together in tough times and help each other get through things. And we need, as we look at, you know, some of the partisan stuff that's going on, we need to, that this is the moment that the people who understand that we are more powerful together than we are apart um, need to be the loudest voice in the room, not the people on the fringes, not the conspiracy theorists, but the people who understand that we need to get to the truth for sure about what happened so we don't let this happen again. But more important, as a country, we are more powerful when we're not a house divided, and uh, and the partisan bickering that's gone on nationally and, and locally has got to go out the window. We're all in it together. We don't we don't get sick and die based on party affiliation or ideology. 
we get sick and, and die based on different factors, and we need to make sure that we're all looking out for each other, that the person who's 25 who may have no symptoms when they get it, if they're not responsible for understanding that their parents or grandparents or friends around them could get sick and die, not that they're immune, but they have to, everybody has to be responsible here, and that's going to get us through, and, and sure. we will prevail, and we will come out of this stronger, so. Well, well said, Norman. It's it's basically to your credit and Susan's credit uh, for marshalling, you know, not only your, your individual towns, but, you know, what you're doing at the state, and, you know, both you and Susan have really, uh, uh, you know, ratcheted it up and, you know, getting the information out, and like I say, uh, uh, put aside the partisanship and, uh, you know, uh, you know, just get it and roll up your sleeves and get it done. So, you know, uh, kudos to both you and Susan. I don't know, Susan, do you have any questions for Norm? Um, well, I, I uh, think you've answered an awful lot of them, Norm, and I appreciate a lot of the information that you're sharing. I know that there's still a lot of work that the state is going to be involved with as far as the reentry of our society and how we're going to manage effectively. And as you pointed out, and I think Russ said as well, the importance of upping the testing of this virus, as well as the second nature, wearing masks and face coverings, as well as making sure that we keep that social distance. We will get through this, uh, but I think our habits will become cemented, and they're good general um, ways of making sure we don't get disease. And I really think how important that is, and it can't be said enough, and it needs to just become second nature to us. Great. Thank you, Susan. Um, awesome. <clears throat> Portland's lucky to have a great leadership team in place to help them get through this. So. Well, we do have quite a few people that are helping, and uh, certainly yeah. between you and our state representative, Christy Carpino, um, the both of you always work on the betterment of our community, regardless of your political affiliation, you get the job done, both of you. And that's what we love about you and want to give you all the support that we need. Um, and be before too much longer, I want to give a little update on some of the things, Norm, that we're doing in Portland so that you can uh, also perhaps give us some advice and help us in some regards in that, re in that aspect. So one of the things that uh, has been divulged this week is that our public schools will not be returning. We know now that they will not return before September, that the rest of the school year will be distance learning. We had a budget hearing last night, Norm, in uh, our Zoom studio, and we had over 70 people that were listening and contributing to the information that we need as far as how we're going to pass our budget. You know, looking forward to next year, we're going to need to do a lot of things, and it was a wonderful discussion, and we look forward as the Board of Selectmen in making certain that we get our budget uh, put forward and know that it's got to be flexible. We don't exactly know what we'll need in the non-COVID-19 crisis here, but there's going to be some changes, and I'm looking forward to working with the Board on that. The other thing I wanted to talk about, and it was mentioned earlier in this podcast, is the importance of knowing what our community needs are. And I'm getting some information in my office that some of our families and single people that live alone may be struggling with food. And we want to reach out to everyone and let them know that we have a very strong and active food bank. And if they need help in regard to food or they know someone that may be struggling at this point, these COVID-19 days are very different, and many of the people that need some assistance are not the ones that typically are in need. They're usually the ones that have been giving. And at this point, I want to point out to call the food bank if you have a need, 860-342-6795. And you can also call my office at 860-342-6715. And we'll make sure that we assist you. And I want to say a deep and, and heartfelt thanks to Ruth Mayo, our director of the food bank here in Portland. She does an outstanding job with her volunteers, and they are looking at some opportunities to reach out to the community. So stay tuned to that. We'll have more information on that 
in a future episode. A few other things that I want to talk about is Memorial Day. May is Memorial Month, and it's something that we are working on with Sarah Sterry Rudder, who's our chairman of our Memorial Day parade. I'll put that in quotations. There will not be the parade as we've known it for so many years, but rather we're going to have some other very respectful um, actions that we'll be taking. I know that within our Portland High School, Ms. Kristen Novak, who is our Director of Music and, and Instruments. She will be working with Mr. Tucker, I believe, and they're going to be having some youngsters in our schools singing and performing in tribute to our fallen heroes. So again, look forward to giving you more information on that in future podcasts. I also want to point out that last night at the Board of Selectmen's meeting, we did talk about our own re-entry committee. We know that the way we conduct business at Town Hall, the way our Parks and Recreation is going to be conducting summer camps, and even the way that in the future education will occur, we need to have a group, a go-to, that will do some of that uh, regulation, some of that procedure, some of that guidance that we all need in re-entering some of the very active activities that need to occur. And last night it was decided that the Board of Selectmen will sit as the re-entry committee. Myself and Ralph Zampano, who is our Deputy for Selectmen, will work. We're going to work together with our staff, our very capable directors within the town and all of the people that are employed by the town. And we know that we will be able to put forward a very workable plan so that we can maintain our services. We can make sure that our businesses will flourish once again. And we're going to do that by putting together some guidance and getting input from people. So those re those reentry committee activities will occur. We'll talk about them on our meetings through Zoom. And stay tuned to that. We, we really believe that we can do this and we'll be working very hard on that. So those are the updates from the town, Dave. I'll turn it back to you. Great. Thank you, Susan. Awesome job. And uh, we also want to make mention that uh, uh, last night uh, that we are going to be doing a parade tomorrow for uh, a student and teacher appreciation, which is going to be uh, originating here at the high school. And from what I'm understanding, uh, there are going to be uh, two groups of 50 vehicles, okay, that are going to be going uh, throughout the town. And uh, again, just reaching out and uh, letting the students know that we care about them and the uh, the students care about the teachers. And uh, that's going to be a great event. Uh, our IT team, Kevin Armstrong, myself, and uh, a couple of our students, as well as one of our board of select, we're going to be uh, filming it. And so uh, hopefully, Hopefully we'll get some uh, right. YouTube right. going on that. Yeah, that's Friday, May 8th, and um, it's going to be quite a parade. And it's really the teachers reaching out to our students and pointing out, once again, Norm, how important our community is. And that community is getting us through this COVID-19. For sure. For sure. All right. Um, I think that's going to kind of wrap us up here. I know uh, Bob Shea, who normally uh, appears on our podcast every week, I know he's been involved in a lot of meetings with the bridge construction and so forth. So unfortunately, I don't think uh, Bob is going to make it with us today, but uh, he will be back with us next week uh, from that standpoint. Again, uh, we are live right now here at the Town Tech Educational Podcast Studio at Portland High School. And uh, uh, the, the studio is uh, here with our Town Tech class. And we've been doing this. This is our seventh episode, uh, and we've been getting in excess of anywhere between three to eight hundred listens uh, to our podcast. Uh, and uh, uh, once we do uh, record the podcast, uh, Kevin Armstrong, our engineer, is going to be doing the post processing, and we also put visuals to it so we can get it over to the Comcast Public Access uh, TV studio, and they are going to be airing that. Uh, four times uh, in the, the upcoming week on uh, Tuesday morning at 9 and, and again at 4. And then they've been doing it on Saturdays uh, at noon and 8. So um, for those of you that uh, 
haven't caught the podcast, our previous podcasts, you can uh, tune in at uh, channel 15 at uh, Comcast, or you can hit our YouTube channel, which is YouTube forward slash Portland Con, which is uh, P-O-R-T-L-A-N-D-C-O-N-N. And uh, there is also a link for the present podcast on our website. So uh, without further ado, I think that wraps it up for episode seven here at our and a weekly Portland podcast. So in the meantime, stay home, stay, stay safe, and wash your hands. Keep your personal space clean. Respect the social distancing. Friday kids a cold Rona, cold Rona. Not an Asian, black or white. The corona is colorblind. Together we can win the fight. Friday kids a cold Rona, cold Rona. Stay ready today, and tomorrow will be okay. Together we can win the fight. Friday kids a cold Rona, cold Rona.